Oh, I didn't get an agenda. Did you put it on my desk, Amory? Uh, it should be. I'll get Oliver to go get it. Okay, all right. Oh, I didn't get an agenda. Did you put it on my desk, Amory? Uh, it should be. I'll get Oliver to go get it. Okay, all right. What's that delay? Sounds like a replay. Yeah. It was. That's funny. Oh, I didn't get an agenda. Put so much gas, baby. Uh, Maybe I'll get all of her to go get it. Three times. Got delay. Jennifer. Oh. Uh, yeah. It was. I'm working. I'm working on it here. <laughs> Give me one sec. I wonder if it's because many of us have our mics on. Well, and it's because I have the YouTube open. Uh, Three times. Delay. Jennifer. Uh, it was. I'm working. I'm working out here. Give me one sec. I wonder if it's because many of us have our mics off. Well, Maybe we should disconnect and start over. Hey, are we ready? Or is that a problem with somebody? Well, the mayor disappeared. Are you good now, Jennifer? Yep. Yeah, we're good to go. Estelle and John aren't coming in? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, All right, then I'll call the special meeting of Vampire Town Council for Monday, May 11th, 2020 at 3 p.m. to order, please. Roll call. Councillor McGee? Here. Councillor Toner? Here. Councillor Burnett? Here. Councillor Grinstead? Here. Councillor Strike? Here. County Councilor Lynch? Here. And Mayor Stack? Here. Any disclosure of pecuniary interests? Seeing none. Here. We need the adoption of the agenda. Oh, I jumped on. Sorry about that. Thanks, Emily. Okay. And then go ahead. No problem. Be it resolved that the agenda for the special meeting of council dated Monday, May 11th, 2020, be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. See Lynn and Chris. All in favor? Carried, thank you. So then we have the minutes from April 27th. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, for the pecuniary interest, uh, if we're going to be talking about uh, grants to the airport, I'll declare a pecuniary interest and go away. Okay. We'll see as we go through, right? Thanks. I didn't... Okay, the minutes then. That the minutes of the special meeting of council listed under item 5A on the agenda be adopted. Move and seconder, please. Lisa and Tom, all in favor? Thank you, Terry. So, virtual parapalooza of Scram, eh? Yes, sir. Motion? No. So, Graham, you're up. All right, so just a bit of a, a bit, a bit of a background here. Prior Palooza 2020 was scheduled for uh, Saturday, the 6th of June, 2020 at Robert Simpson Park from 11 in the morning until 11 in the afternoon. Um, Prior Palooza typically features a day of music, food, family entertainment, as we celebrate our great community. Uh, and another key element to Prior Palooza, of course, is our annual model train show that runs both uh, the Saturday and the Sunday. So that would have been the sixth and the seventh uh, this year at the Nick Smith Center. Hey, I'm uh, going, whatever happened. We all good? No, I'm, okay, I think I'm good. I, own, I don't have everybody on, on I only have uh, Maureen and Tom, Dan and uh, Emily. Yeah, so when you need to see someone, Walter, there's a little arrow on the bottom box that you can click on to see the rest. Well then. Okay, yeah, just a sec. Oh uh, yeah, okay, I follow you, good. Just going back to the fine grain. There, good. Good to go? Okay. Um, so the musical lineup for this uh, this summer's festival um, included the following 10 performers. 
uh, Gail Gavin, Ainsley Phillips and Friends, Simon Clark, Cal Feliver and Brandy Creek, Valley Mountain Band, Brian Riss Band, uh, Jonesy, which was a Beatles tribute band, Eric Watson, Marlene Fawcett, and the Derringers. Uh, so just um, a bit more background here. On the 17th of March, the province of Ontario declared an emergency uh, declaration. On the 30th of March, the province ordered closures of parks and outdoor recreation uh, amenities. On the 14th of April, council voted to cancel or postpone all events through to the 30th of June of 2020. And staff have since been working on virtual options for uh, this festival. So background on our virtual prior palooza. The aim is to run uh, the virtual prior palooza on the exact same day as the event, which would be the 6th of June, but perhaps with a more reduced time frame. Um, important to provide uh, the community with an outlet to enjoy uh, great music, family entertainment, and promote our local businesses through uh, this virtual festival. And the aim is to run the virtual prior palooza at no cost through virtual uh, platform and volunteer support from our artists and entertainers uh, that would have otherwise been part of the, um, the actual event on the 6th of June. Uh, so we've already seen a lot of virtual events uh, taking place on Facebook page pages and other platforms that have been successful. Um, one locally that we've seen a lot of success uh, has been the open mic night at the Iron Power Legion. That's been running every second Friday uh, throughout the course of uh, this, this COVID-19 crisis uh, that's involved some local artists and it's, uh, it's looked tremendously well. Um, and then there's another Facebook page called the Isolation 2020 Country Jamboree. Um, it is now uh, well over 25,000 followers on that page. There is new co content posted on it daily. Um, and it also includes a lot of local artists from, from our community as well that have um, posted some videos to that page. So uh, we've seen a lot of success from these, these virtual platforms. And, um, you know, the reality is it's kind of become a bit of the new norm uh, in this process. Uh, so I've already reached out to some of the artists and um, well to all the artists to kind of let them know of the changes and some have already agreed uh, to virtually perform for the event already um, and would certainly open it up to other local artists to provide us with content for this virtual event. Um, typically we have um, our, our bands performing for about 45 minutes so not certainly going to be asking these people to, to do a 45 minute set. Uh, virtually for us, but even if they do a couple of songs and then we can, um, you know, perhaps even add some some further uh, artists and entertainers throughout the course of the, um, uh, the virtual event that day. Um, and we're also going to be working with local restaurants to promote uh, that they can be getting takeout from them. Um, our marketing and economic development officer has been in, uh, you know, close contact with all the businesses that are operating during this period in time. Um, we certainly want to, um, you know, try and support them as we typically would have, you know, involvement of them at Prior Palooza and, you know, a big uh, food feature uh, with, um, with food trucks and whatnot. Um, so we'll also be reaching out to, um, to Little Ray's Reptiles, still waiting for a response to them to see what virtual content might be possible for them as they have been a staple uh, at Prior Palooza the last number of years. And we continue to work with uh, our train show organizer to determine uh, what virtual content could be provided uh, to showcase the model train exhibits that we would otherwise see up at our Nick Smith Center. And uh, we're also reaching out to contacts to further our family and entertainment aspect. Uh, so magicians, ventriloquists, uh, princesses, comedians, buskers, those types of things uh, to again provide lots of entertainment um, uh, for everyone through our virtual event. Uh, so the platform for our virtual prior, pal prior palooza uh, we're looking at creating a Facebook page uh, to post the content through uh, throughout the day on the, the 6th of June. Uh, we believe it to be best for the content to be pre-submitted as opposed to running it live via Zoom or YouTube or any other platform. Uh, this eliminates any kind of technology uh, mishaps that we might have. And of course, because it is uh, our Facebook page, we want to make sure that we've, uh, we've vetted and can control the content uh, that's going out to the public and um, certainly eliminates any uh, issues in that regard. Uh, so at this time, uh, any questions, I'd be uh, happy to take them. Okay, thanks, Graham. Great idea. Uh, any comments or questions? Lee, uh, Lynn? So I just have a couple, Graham. Um, so 
um, I guess I wrote down, actually, will this be a continual, but I guess uh, towards the end, you kind of answered that because you said you're going to be posting to the Facebook ongoing throughout the course of the day. So it won't be like one continual thing. People will have to keep coming back to look at it. Um, I think, you know, Lindsay and I are going to wait and see kind of what we get in terms of a response for people providing content. And once we have an understanding as to, to how much has been built in there, um, then we'll be able to determine how it's going to go. So as it stands right now, how I see it is just kind of putting together a schedule that people can kind of see. So um, much like we would for prior Palooza, we say that this band plays at 11, the next one's at noon, at one, and there's always breaks in between. Um, so I think that's the the way that we're going to look um, at, at doing it right now. But again, we have to see what kind of response we get from these individuals, uh, as well as bringing in some of the other types of, of entertainment as well. Like if Little Rays comes on board or if we have any other, um, you know, comedians, ventriloquists, magicians, et cetera, come on board, then we can kind of work out a schedule that way. And then just kind of branch them on a schedule. Okay. So you said a couple of songs from each each performer. A couple of songs wouldn't give you, you know, it will only give you what ten minutes if they do a couple of songs. Um, I'm thinking any performer once they have their stuff set up, because I'm knowing that my partner is a performer. Once they get going, they can go. So I'm yeah. wondering if we maybe 45 minutes is too long, but maybe you ask for seven or eight songs because that will literally give you a half hour probably of content by the time they talk in between. Just talking out of, you know, thinking to keep somebody there for two songs and then to go away to come back to see two songs of somebody else, I'm thinking that we might not keep their attention long enough. Absolutely, and I agree. Um, if they're willing to provide us with more time, we're obviously more than happy to have that from them. Um, the challenge with some of the groups would be that um, if it's kind of a, a solo artist or a couple, it's usually a lot easier because they're, they're typically, um, you know, in, in the same location, whereas it might be a bit more challenging for, for some of the bands to put together, um, you know, a few different things like that. So some of them might already have some pre-recorded content, which we could potentially use, but we would like it to, to kind of have that, that kind of live feel where they're, they're kind of reaching out in the moment and, and that type of thing. So. Absolutely. But um like you said, there's so much out there happening right now virtually where you see all the different panels of the band, just like we are seeing right now with our with our meeting. And that is so cool. So I'm sure, again, um, a performer that's very dedicated to their craft will have a setup at home. So they will be able to do this virtual and record it and send it in for sure. So that's very cool. Hey, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Graham, I'm not a techie. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter or any other social stuff. I do get to see YouTube. I, I can get to that part. So hypothetically, I'm a, a performer. I submit my performance to you. You vet it. And then at a given time, you can put it out on YouTube. Or do I have to have Facebook to see the performer? Uh, I think based on the way that we're scheduling it, you'd want to have Facebook, but because we now also have a Town of Empire Facebook page or a, sorry, YouTube channel, uh, we would, we should be able to, you know, produce something that then does appear on, on YouTube. Yes. Great. Thank you. Anything further from council? Lisa? Yeah. Um, recognizing the fact that we need to physically distance and this this may be um, adding more <clears throat> than is possible to your workload, Graham. But Pirate Palooza has always been very interactive. A lot of, you know, people get up and they dance and they move around and they do their thing. Um, is there any way or can some consideration be given to <laughs> I, I, reaching out and, and, you know, videoing families dancing on their front lawn as part, you know, keeping a distance and, and incorporating that in somehow, or um, I, I, I don't know if, if maybe there's some way to engage people and, and get them more involved so that it is more of a community kind of a feel. And, and again, I'm just throwing that out there um, just because, you know, again, a big part of the attraction of Prior Palooza is the, um, you know, the, the community getting together. Um, but I, I admire the initiative. I think it's fantastic and I'll certainly be tuning in, but uh, just something to maybe give some thought to. 
No, it's it's a it's a great point, Lisa, and I and I think that what we would uh, try and build on is a lot of the content that we've already been putting out on our Facebook page, where you know um, anything that we've pulled from our recreation at home website, we've asked people to kind of share a photo or something in the comment section on our Facebook page to say, hey, show us you know your child's drawing or you know something that your family's doing to to celebrate something. So no, that's a great point, and we'll we'll certainly try and uh, engage our followers as much as we can. Good. Anyone else, Chris? Yeah. Yep. Um, I know in the past, you know, the prior Palooza, it's been really uh, fortunate to have, you know, worked alongside uh, like some partnerships, you know, uh, and you know some some outside uh, sponsorships. Um, is this something that we could do here, uh, Graham, or or are we going to just try to do this on our own? Um, the intention right now is to, you know, to kind of run it um, at, at no cost because, you know, typically prior Paloozers run um, exclusively on the sponsorship funding as well as the support we get from from our community um, outfits like the Optimist, the Lions Club, the Rotary Club and, and so forth. All those, uh, all that generosity is what allows this event to continue. So, um, you know, we haven't reached out to any of the typical sponsors just because there isn't that... Um, you know, there, there wasn't that opportunity at the time. Um, that's something that, that Lindsay and I could certainly discuss if we think that, you know, some of those sponsors could, could come on board. But um, I think our opinion at the time was that, you know, there's a lot of other things that they're worrying about right now, especially yeah. with some of those businesses. So um, it is not something that we've explored at this moment. No. Okay. No, that's good. Just uh, to follow up on Chris, there's maybe a, a note to them saying, you know, thanks for the past and we're looking forward to, connecting again next year might be a good idea just so they they know what's happening i saw somebody else oh tom yeah i'm just curious as to um whether there's any consideration as to just delaying it into uh suggest maybe august or september that things might open up that we can get back to some sort of normalty uh well question <laughs> go ahead Greg. Uh, we'd certainly love to, to see it happen um, later in the year, if, if that's something that is that is possible, and then we would kind of go back to the same uh, process that we would um, that we would have been doing kind of throughout the, the winter and the spring, and reaching out to the sponsors and and obviously working with all the um, the artists and the entertainers to see if they're available. And I've already had uh, have said to them that you know if we are able to do this uh, you know kind of live and in person, then uh, they'll be the first phone call to kind of have this, uh, you know, pretty much replicate as we, we had it planned in the first place. Yeah, I think it was a good question, like I said, but the reality, this is nice to keep it alive and kind of get, get something back out into the community. Like now, you know, summer starts to, to break, you know. Anybody else? No? Uh, okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Just to follow up then, uh, what I'm hearing then, the possibility is that if there was something that we get everything open up again, that we could have an additional one sort of later on in the year. I, I would certainly like to think so. And I think that, um, I think that the community would certainly have an appetite for something like that. I think we'd all want to, uh, to have some type of, of celebration when we're, we're safe and able to do so. Yeah, because we, we have to consider a lot of uh, elderly people do not have computers, cell phones, things like that. So they get that opportunity to go live and they enjoy it. So that was the reason I was asking. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah, and even without a smart TV, they don't get YouTube, you know, so. Yeah, it's good. Like I've been saying along, maybe we'll have a Canada Day and on Labor Day or something, you know, and how it goes. Anything else? No, and uh, I need a mover and a seconder, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lynn shaking her head no again. I'm, Looking at the clerk here, and I can bar barely see the clerk. So. It's a presentation, so there's no mover and second. No. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, good. Then we'll move on. And uh, the staff reports then in, uh, the, regarding the business continuity plan. That council receives this report for information. Now I need a mover and seconder for this. Lynn, Dan. Robin? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a quick update for Council. I, I know um, 
there have been several questions about opening up um, and that kind of thing. So I thought I'd take a moment to sort of brief council on where we're at. As, as council is aware, we've uh, been operating under our business continuity plan since uh, March 25th that, or earlier actually. Um, and you know, different branches and different departments operating at different levels in, in house, um, making sure that we have site, uh, staff on site and that we also minimize um, our contact with each other so that we make sure that, that we're available for the public. We are social distancing, we are uh, minimizing the number of staff that could be impacted and ensuring appropriate cover off if uh, someone needs to be off work. So all that has continued to go on and um, I think an important point is that the current situation remains very dynamic. Staff are continuing to monitor the situation as, it, as the province rolls out changes and we're adjusting our, our plan as needed um, based on an, any restrictions and measures that the government puts in place. Uh, we do know that on April 27th, the government unveiled their guiding principles for our ability to reopen the province and we're seeing some changes um, roll out almost daily from, from them. Um, we want to make sure that um, we have the necessary plan in place for when the um, the emergency order is lifted or, or orders are lifted or changes are made to the restrictions that we're under. We know now uh, that the legislature is planning on sitting tomorrow and presumably the uh, emergency declaration will be extended now till June 2nd. So that gives us another date to sort of work, work towards. Um, the province did come out with some uh, safety guidelines for businesses reopening, office openings, industry, those kinds of things. And we're using those to assist us in, in the preparation of a recovery and reopening plan here at the town hall. Uh, and our plan will address all those challenges that we need to to make sure that our workplace is safe for, for both the staff and for the public that uh, when they're ready to come back in. Um, we're doing risk assessments at all our facilities. We're creating standard operating procedures and we're pre preparing the communications that we'll need to be able to provide the pro uh, government, uh, sorry, the public, um, so that they're aware of what our restrictions or any rules around coming to our facility might be. Um, we are working on uh, a plan, I think that's most important to council and to the public at this point around uh, reopening our landfill. We have, uh, multiple comments from the public about uh, the need to be able to, uh, to attend this facility. You know, garbage collection, certainly an essential service, and we've done uh, our part in making sure that our, our garbage pickups uh, curbside have continued on. And in fact, we increased the bag limit from two to four to make sure that people stuck at home um, had that available to them. Uh, but we still know that, that there are people who want to make uh, use of our landfill site itself. Our landfill site is operated by a contractor on our behalf, and um, we want to make sure that there's uh, appropriate measures in place for the public safety when they go to that facility and that there's uh, tools to be able to um, make payment arrangements for vouchers uh, alternatively. So uh, we're hoping to make an announcement within the next couple of weeks to hopefully at the most um, where we are prepared to, to advise council that it, it can be opened safely and that we can uh, operate properly. Uh, with respect to um, the marina and uh, boat launch, we are again reminding council that we consider the boat launch part of our marina. We know that um, Department of Fisheries, Fisheries and Oceans have uh, considered us a harbor and consider it one facility, and they are uh, recommending that we remain close to the public. Uh, boat launches um, around our area are continuing to open, as we've seen in many of our um, neighboring municipalities. Red Pine Bay launch is now open on the Ottawa. Uh, launches in Mississippi Mills as well. So we know that there, there are launches available to our public and we hope that they, um, they make use of those in the meantime. And again, we will continue to monitor that situation and advise council as necessary. And hopefully sooner rather than later, we can move forward. Um, so that, that was just the, the gist of the plan, just some more information about uh, what we're working on here to, to in uh, advance of, of the, uh, the province making declarations. Okay, comments or questions? Lisa. Thanks, Robin. Um, so um, with regards to the landfill, is there any way to speed that up? Um, I, I know that you mentioned, you know, a couple of weeks. Is it, is, is there anything that can be done to make that fact? Because there's, there's a lot of pushback and, and I understand it. You know, I'm, I'm suffering myself with um, a mound of, you know, sort of some renovation waste and, and what have you. Is there any way at all that that can be? Um, yeah. You know? 
Yeah, good question. I think for uh, for staff, the the ability to open the town hall and and sell vouchers directly again, rather than uh, needing an online service, will make a difference. So that's our, our number one goal. Um, and if we can do that sooner, um, we're going to do that. Um, we're hoping to, like I said, have an announcement before the two weeks are out. But that that would be uh, the opportunity for us to go back to a bit of a norm as far as uh, the voucher sales, which is uh, sort of a, a bit of a problem. Can if so follow up on that first one? Can online sales not? You know, there's so many different obvious square things like that where, you know, someone can flash a, a payment confirmation receipt. Um, have those been explored? Is that an option? Absolutely, we're exploring all those options, um, and we think we found the best solution. What we're hoping is that this is a robust, robust enough answer that we can continue it on after the fact. Um, that it's not just a, a simple um, or a shortcut measure to to get it done today, but that it's a uh, a system that we will have in place uh, for all timing. It, it increases our uh, electronic, um, I'm not gonna use the right word, but our e-initiatives, I think is what we call them, um, ability for people to have more convenience by using online methods. And this is just another step in that. Um, so we're, we're integrating it into our existing system, which is what takes a little bit more time. Okay, and one more quick one, if I may, uh, regarding the marina. Help me to understand, please. This is, this is definitely a me issue. What makes our, marina boat launch a harbor how are we different than the other ones that are able to open up now uh, to the public um so right now boat launches are only allowed to open if they're not part of a boat of a marina ours is part of marina. we are part of uh we have a lease with df dfo department of fisheries and oceans uh for the marina land itself and our operations there and so um our understanding from their correspondence to us is that it's considered one facility and that under that regulation, as far as the closure of marinas, we, we fall under that as, as part of our facility and it's an integral part. Anyone else? I have a couple then too, just to follow up on that one, because I think that's worth clarifying because if in fact, and Robin and I had chatted a bit about this, if we don't have our slips in and we don't offer fuel and we don't do anything except open the launch, you know, I, I, I think for the general public, they need to hear that We've at least researched that potential uh, use. It's fine to say you can go to Red Pine Bay and Brayside, but they look at it as, well, that, that's on the Ottawa River, it's land. And I don't know why, uh, I, and I don't know if Mangab Brayside does or doesn't have a lease for their operation. I have no, no understanding on it. But uh, I know Oceans and Fisheries Control, we did have the one email that said June 1st or something last week, you know. But I think it's worth getting in touch with them and asking them and verifying so that if it's only the launch operation, is there some flexibility there? Because there's certain, it's like the landfill, there's a lot of pressure about that one. And yeah. if we're gonna allow our people to be on the Ottawa, difference does it make if they go to Brayside and get on it or here? My one concern, all that said, is the imported traffic and how do you control that? You know, because that's a, you know, it becomes a health and safety concern in terms of the usage of it. And we know there's a, a lot of uh, out of town traffic there too. So I'm kind of, you know, back and forth on it a bit. But I'd like to know if there's really a technical thing. Ted has his hand up. Just to follow up, uh, if by chance uh, Fisheries and Oceans would agree, uh, based on what you said, Robin, and allow us to open, then what are the plans for staffing it? Yeah. So currently we didn't have any plans to bring staff, you know, the marina staff back on this year without the marina open. And until such time as we decide to open the marina, we wouldn't be uh, calling those those operators in. So we just open it. Right. And, and only provide the launch service, nothing else. If they want to use it, if they're on their own schedule at their own risk, you know, sort of thing. But that would be my thought that they're not adding any services, providing any staff hours to it. It's a place to put your boat in and that's it. We should be prepared to post it according to that. Yeah, signage would be important. Right. Anybody else in the boat launch? I just want to follow up on the on the on the landfill because I got to tell you my emails were alive about it this weekend too. So I, I'm looking at you know I've been shopping a bit retail wise and looking how Canadian Tire, Home Hardware, all the others are managing the flow. Is the intention because even when you have all these e services available again, there's going to be a Part of this population who is going to have to come in and buy it. 
So I look at the downstairs, could we not provide that kind of, you know, the six foot spots on the sidewalk and, and in and control the flow in there? There is already a, a screen there. And, and I'm wondering, is that what staff are looking at to, to put in place? So, Absolutely what we're looking at putting in place, sir, yeah. Because yeah, that might be something that we could do even shorter than the E system to, uh, yeah. to sell tabs and that. Yeah, we're hoping, we're hoping that that's the case. Okay. Okay, good, thanks. Question, could you explain that a little okay. further, please? Sorry? Could you explain that a little further? What well, is it? my comment, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, like for example, I went up to Home Hardware the other day. So we stand and they have on the sidewalk red spots or yes. yellow lines for you to stand your six feet apart and social distance. And they have a staff person there actually that comes out and asks what you're doing. And this was before they were allowed to open on Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they would go in and get your stuff. The, the cashier was just at your entranceway and you would come there and tab your debit or credit card and leave with your product. So I'm thinking that's something that could be done downstairs as well. And I know there has to be some thinking about that in detail because there's traffic moves up and down the, the stairs as well there too. But, but even when the e-pay system's in place, there are gonna be rate payers in town who won't be using that system and need passes for the dump. So, yeah. you know, and that may allow us to open quicker is what I'm thinking. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank good, thanks. So we need a vote now on this one. All in favor? Good, thank you. Okay, so the next staff report is uh, the general manager treasurer regarding the biannual, biannual, sorry, financial update. That council receive report 2005-1102 as information and that council authorize the following to build further contingency funding to support financial impacts due to COVID-19, placing the CIP program on hold for 2020, reduce scope of the eco-friendly weed spray program, reduce scope of spring summer plantings, beach sand replenishment on hold until province allows beach openings, place minor capital projects on hold at 50%, place purchase of community hall divider on hold. That council directs staff to contact organizations receiving a 2020 municipal grant to request an updated 2020 projected budget included, including any potential grant amendments be submitted by September 1st, 2020 for consideration. And that during the state of the declared provincial emergency, further financial updates be brought forward to council once per month by the general manager, client services treasurer. Moving seconder, please. Lynn and Lisa. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stack, members of council. Um, I did do a PowerPoint presentation. It is quite a lengthy report. So uh, I did do one here that will hopefully uh, uh, help me out with the presentation. So I'm just gonna put it up here. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay for that so walk through it. okay so really this report is kind of um, almost split into um, two sections uh, one it was really um, that front part was the biannual financial report um, that I normally bring forward to council around this May June time frame uh, and then really the back end of the report the second part of it was really those COVID-19 financial um, updates and projections so first um, some bit of background. So as per the procedural bylaw, um, I am um, required under there to provide council with biannual financial reports. So really the intent of the report is to provide council with a clear picture um, of the town's financial status, uh, identify any financial matters of concern, um, and update council on the progress and improvements made to date on any finance related initiatives. Um, so needless to say, under this uh, COVID-19 umbrella that we're working under, um, uh, things are a little bit different this year than per the norm, uh, than what a normal financial report would look like. So first I wanted to touch base with um, the variance report for the operating budget. So the variance report outlines the financial results uh, and it is broken down by revenues and expenses. And we do show the April 2020 year to dates uh, against the 2020 budget and show that variance. And we also show a comparison against the April 2019 year to dates. Um, so interestingly, um, the financial results um, 
um, that are shown. What I've done this time to give a bit more detail is I have broken down by uh, levy-based um, major and then major self-sustaining cost centers such as water, wastewater, uh, waste management, building services, and those things. So council will get a better feel for how those revenues are, and expenses are sitting with the various cost centers. Um, so not to go, I'm not going to go through all of the, the charts and the numbers, um, but what you can see in the top table is that you can see for uh, revenues, uh, the overall, um, last year at this time sat at about 42% of the budgeted revenues. Uh, this year we're currently in 2020 sitting at 44% um, of budgeted revenues, and uh, which interestingly enough is higher. Uh, whenever we go down to the expenditure side, uh, we're you can see that overall, um, the 2019 expenditures to date, 43% uh, of the budget was expended at this time, as opposed to in 2020, it's actually the same. We're sitting at that 43%. Um, no, the reason I showed these tables to show the various um, funding cost centers, levy versus the environmental um, and things like building services is because when you drive down into those numbers, you can see where some of those items are, um, are actually uh, being impacted by COVID-19 and I'll touch base a little bit more on those impacts. So, um, and really what I was just saying here is that you can see for those individual cost centers, a number of them that are trending lower um, and, and a few of them are actually being offset by some that are trending a little bit higher. So to walk through a little bit of that detail, um, we can see that um, the clerk's office, that the revenues from licensing, commissioning of oaths, um, and marriage fees, um, they are coming in trending lower in 2020 than 2019. Uh, you're looking at about 12% versus 46% of budgeted revenues. And this is really directly related to that impact of closing town hall for, with the facility closure. Uh, we're also seeing with bylaw enforcement some reduced parking fines um, whenever you look at compared to 2020 to 2019. Uh, and really, uh, once again, COVID-19 related, I really think this is related to there's just less vehicle movement. People are remaining at home. People aren't out and about. Um, I think some of the places like uh, down near the hospital and things, they have the gates open. So people are moving a little bit more freely in there without some parking restrictions. Uh, and it really is just gen uh, generating less parking, uh, parking fines. Um, of course, one of the larger ones when we look at is recreation programs. So with the cancellation of the spring and summer programs and the events, we have those revenue impacts as well. Um, and when you look at the comparison for the marina, um, the same time this time last year, we would have had some revenues rolling in from some of the uh, slip rentals. However, right now we're sitting at zero revenues um, um, and kind of already touched on in Robin with her open uh, report on opening town facilities. Really, we will be doing that cost analysis exercise to determine uh, the financial feasibility uh, before we proceed with you know hiring people or or you know bringing those crane rentals in to put in the docks which are quite expensive and things like that uh, we will do that analysis uh, uh, prior for that facility opening right now in the budget uh, we do run that marine at about a thirteen thousand uh, dollar loss uh, on the taxpayer of that budget so we'll want to make sure that before we were to open that up that we're around that either that similar or better uh, financial status uh, continuing to look at revenues, uh, if we look at the cemetery cost center, uh, our revenues are down slightly. Um, we don't have a huge concern here. Uh, we have heard through the grapevine that, that really some people um, who unfortunately, um, you know, have had the loss of a loved one is that we feel that some of these things are being deferred. Uh, we feel that some people are holding on um, uh, and not proceeding with some internments until perhaps later on in the year, uh, whenever um, you know, burials could have more people and they could have more of them, uh, uh, funerals and things could be, have more people um, attend. So we do feel that perhaps this cost center may rebound later in the year. So we'll just keep an eye on that one and monitor it and see how it goes. Uh, when we're looking at water and wastewater, we are trending some lower revenues on the water and wastewater. Um, we can see that the commercial and industrial consumption uh, is down uh, in the month of April, uh, particularly. Um, however, you do see that offsetting uh, residential consumption is up. Um, overall, though, um, the residential consumption is not increasing enough to offset what the commercial industrial consumption is uh, lowering. Um, moving on uh, to waste management, um, we can see that less revenue is coming in from having the closure of the landfill. There is a, a reduction in the landfill tipping fees. Um, but as already uh, raised by Robin in the prior report, uh, those procedures are being put in place in order to accelerate that opening to the public. 
uh, revenues. Uh, this cost center is actually up, so it's trending, uh, trending higher. Uh, for vehicles and equipment, which is an internal cost center, we actually have our revenues up by over 17%. Uh, we think that a lot of this would be attributable to potentially the uh, sidewalk articulating uh, machines uh, running throughout the winter and generating uh, the revenues into that cost center for vehicle usage. Um, and another cost center that is actually trending higher uh, on the revenues is our building uh, permitting, uh, building permits. So already by end of April, um, the revenues brought in on that line uh, are um, already at 89% of the budget of revenues uh, for the year. So. Um, there's been, uh, Jacques had quite a, a, a boom in that first, first period of the year. Whenever we flip over to the expenses uh, for 2020 compared to 2019, um, when we look at winter control, right now at this point in the year, we're sitting at 56% expended um, compared to 88% um, expended in 2019. And, um, and if you look over the past couple of years, we were 88% in 2019, 65% in 2018, 85% in 2017, and 94% in 2016. 56% expended is really the least amount of winter control expended that we have had in the last five years. Um, we think that this is really attributable that there were less winter events um, and a combination of the reduced sidewalk uh, clearing and the use of the articulating machines. So. Um, all that in there um, at least sets us in a good spot heading into the um, heading into the fall season uh, for winter control. Um, on expenses, if we look at uh, vehicles and maintenance, right now uh, we are trending a little bit lower in that cost center, and this could be due to a number of um, items, uh, potentially probably timing of repairs. Um, another cost center that has uh, some reduced expenditures, obviously the crossing guards and the expenditures there are coming in less compared to 2019 and that was due to the school closures uh, from the COVID-19. Oh. Um, when we look at the planning and zoning cost center uh, in the budget, uh, we definitely have some salary savings there and that's um, um, obviously due to um, the appointment of the uh, interim CAO. And uh, also in our water, our water cost center, we're actually trending a little bit lower uh, with our expenses right now. Uh, I don't necessarily think that our, our 2020 uh, expenses are low. I think maybe at this time last year in 2019, our expenses at this year uh, were high. We had some uh, unplanned expenditures at the start of 2019 that I think we're actually making those expenses higher as opposed to our really our 2020s being lower. I think we're trending um, pretty much on target with our 2020 expenses for water. Um, continuing with the biannual financial report, um, I always highlight some other pieces of the uh, of financial related items in the report. Wanted to touch base on a couple of those other financial updates. Um, the first one would be taxes receivable. Um, I know there may be some concern that with, um, you know, the deferral of our tax payments, um, you know, are we having any sort of uh, noticing any sort of difference of revenues coming in on the taxes receivable? Very minor difference when you compare 2019 to 2020. The revenues that the town has uh, to date now received from taxes um, uh, compared to this time last year, I believe it was only about a $40,000 difference. Um, also, um, going forward, uh, the county has now announced that they will be suspending penalty and interest from their June 30th payment that the town would owe the county, and they're extending that to September 30th. So um, the fortunate piece of this is that the town will then save some, um, uh, be able to generate some additional interest on those monies in that time period that will help offset the monies that were being um, uh, lost by how moving the um, deadline for the municipal taxes from the May 30th to the June 30th. Um, and overall, I just wanted to provide uh, council, um, you know, a little bit of a, a warm and fuzzy that we don't feel that there will be any cash flow uh, impacts anticipated at this time. Um, the revenues uh, that um, um, and the reserves and, and that council does have um, sitting in for a cash flow perspective for working capital, I believe will cover all of our um, um, all of our expenses without having any sort of cash flow um, impacts or shortages. So we don't anticipate any sort of issues at that on that stage. Um, the next topic, financial audit and FIRs. Uh, we do have a bit of a delay uh, with the financial audit. Um, just with everything going on with COVID-19, we have worked out a schedule with our auditors to try and uh, do this audit remotely. Uh, normally auditors will come on site and uh, do their field work here. And obviously that's not really an option during these COVID-19 times. So 
Uh, we have worked out um, a schedule with them. Um, they are working uh, full tilt ahead on that audit right now. And uh, however, we are a couple weeks behind a uh, schedule where we would normally be presenting to council at the end of May. We anticipate that those financial statements will come forward to council probably about uh, mid-June. Um, while everyone else has been extending deadlines on things, the one thing that didn't get a deadline extension uh, is actually our FIR submissions to the province. Those are still due uh, May 31st. So, um, however, um, both Estelle and I are working on those FIR uh, submissions. So we still anticipate to be able to submit that uh, uh, by the May 31 timeframe. It'll be a bit of a time crunch, but we're, uh, we're uh, believe we can meet that target. Um, other items that I always talk about my financial update, how we continue um, to follow all of our investment policy rules and regulations with investments. Um, and I also included a bit of a blurb in there on asset management um, and how we're progressing uh, with our asset management plan. Uh, we have um, a draft that should be ready to come forward to council uh, shortly, which is good news. And that pretty much sums up the first part um, of my report, which is really the typical things that you would see under the biannual financial report. I'm going to move now into the second part of the Jennifer, report. sorry, I'm just, I'm just wondering, could we maybe deal with questions on that first half first? And Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I just thought they might have some questions on this that may get lost as we go through the rest of it. Or... Sure, it's a long report. Yeah, a break now is good. Yeah, yeah. So does council, any, I see Lisa's hand up. Pardon me, just a quick, um... Uh, comment observation with a question uh, with regards to the licenses, um, the marriage licenses, because that is, you know, that does generate a, a significant amount of um, um, uh, cash flow. Would you think it's partially because a lot of weddings have been canceled and postponed until um, next year? I know my daughter's, for example, she was supposed to be married this month and um, it's now next year. Um, so given that a lot of that probably is because of delays in, in weddings, will there be any plans in place, not that I want Emily and Maureen working every single weekend to uh, start to finish, but um, is there any way to possibly benefit from the fact that they'll probably be doubling up on, on you know, marriages next uh, next year? I know it's a small item out of that whole list, but, you know, just something that uh, I was thinking. Um, I'll, I'll let Maureen touch on it a little bit more, but I do know that we have been getting some still requests for some marriage licenses. And I think um, based on Robin's reopening plan, should we open town hall uh, shortly, uh, people will still be able to come in and purchase those licenses, which will obviously help on a revenue perspective. Um, regarding uh, quantity, maybe I'll let Maureen touch on, uh, she'll know a little bit more. Okay. So thank you. I was wondering you. if Lisa had plans or so. So we have, I, I mean, I personally have had some cancellations as well, and, and they're planning on going next summer. It could be that we, um, we double up next summer, which is fine as well, if that's needed. Um, we are issuing marriage licenses um, on an appointment basis uh, right now, um, simply because some people really do need to get a marriage license if they're getting married, um, maybe with an officiant and just the four other, like the two witnesses and themselves. So um, we have issued them on those basis if they're getting married uh, that way. So we do have a little bit of income coming in with that, but um, our revenue rather, um, but we do anticipate they'll be doubling up next summer. <laughs> Interesting. Anyone else? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jennifer, just to reconfirm for, for the FIR, as um, the mayor's touched on in the past, without the FIR, we don't get any grants if there are any out there. So to me, uh, well said that you're going to have, or you hope to have this thing in place, but I spend the extra time to, to ensure that we get this thing done so we get some loot if, if it's available. And speaking of loot, the FCM apparently has money to assist in as asset management. I haven't found all the details yet, but it, apparently it's you can make application for it at this time. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? I have a couple comments. One, uh, John and Jennifer, that I know the winter was certainly lighter this year, but I think that move to those sidewalk machines is, is a big impact that we'll probably see going on year after year now in terms of a, of a cost savings there was a good one, you know. Uh, we touched on the uh, on the uh, clerk's office and that 
but I obviously I get all the uh, announcements from both funeral homes and so on. And I tell you, nine out of ten of them are all deferred services, or you know, sometimes in the future there will be a, a a service. So I think that's certainly part of that process as well, too. You know. Um, So, uh, the water and wastewater, and I know between the industrial and uh, and uh, commercial and the residential, is that? Can you, do you have any idea? Can you tell us in maybe a percentage of what's not being offset? You know that re residential is offsetting the the downward flow, and the other two, what's the sort of gap? I guess is what I'm just trying to have an idea. Sure. Uh, when you look at the time period from January all the way to April 30th. Um, Consumption wise on the industrial and commercial, we're down about 50,000 cubic meters of consumption. Um, over that same time period from January all the way to April 30th, we're up only about 1,000 cubic meters on the residential. Um, so clearly we're not having um, uh, all of the residential increases offset that um, commercial industrial uh, impact. Now, if you look at um, um, that on a dollar perspective, um, you know what I mean? It's I, when you take all four months combined, we're looking at about, um, I believe it came out to uh, about net when you take the consumption for the, the commercial industrial against the residential, you're looking about a hundred thousand dollar gap there. Um, once again, when I get down more into my COVID number, numbers, I'll show how I've taken those projections out um, across the year and, um, and what those impacts are on a go forward basis. Um, I think however though, you know, as businesses reopen and um, as um, industry starts running again, um, I'm hoping that April would really be that worst hit month and that we're going to see some improvements uh, in those months continuing um, going forward. So, you know what I mean? We're fingers crossed that uh, we see that uh, not be the continuous trend of what we have right now. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I agree. I but who knows what's going to happen in the next few months, at least anyways. And, you know, as Mr. Ford said, it's uh, not going to be a marathon or not going to be a sprint. It'll be a marathon. So I think things are going to be pretty gradual. Okay. I'm done. Thanks. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor, I think we've lost Chris somewhere. Yeah. Um, he hasn't phoned into anybody or anything. Sorry. I know my screen went uh, sort of blank and then I finally found the PowerPoint so I could watch uh, Jennifer. It looks like Chris is coming back on the bottom maybe. No. Sorry, I didn't realize we lost him. He was trying to reconnect and I had to just click this thing. Okay, we'll just wait a sec, see if we can get him back in. A comment, Mr. Mayor? Go ahead, Dan. Uh, spring is here. I've seen all the tulips out and around. And us being locked in, I'm not a green thumb guy. However, the wife did buy a thousand dollars worth of plants, so I guess we're going to water them. So I got to assume that our residential water should take a real jump for uh, April and May with all these flowers that are out. Thanks. Assuming everybody sent a thousand dollars, is that your? Well, Mother's Day was here, and there's a lot of flowers out. That's what you're going to be doing, Dan. Well, there's Chris back now. Okay. <laughs> okay, so COVID-19 now, Jennifer? Okay, I'm just going to go back to my screen share. Yeah. Um, here my report here. So, for the COVID-19 impacts, um, really I wanted to just touch base on you know, for our 2020 budget, if you look at user fee charges uh, versus taxation revenue, uh, we actually generate 56% of our revenues um, through user fees and charges versus 44% of taxation. So really those user fees and charges are a significant part of the budget. Um, and obviously um, these facility closures are, are, are impacting that ability to generate those user fees and charges. Um, in my COVID-19 analysis that's included in the report, I've included kind of two main sections. Uh, one uh, was able to show council the actual impacts to April 30th. So those are based on um, the real numbers that we were able to obtain um, at the end of the month. Um, it was really important uh, to be able to get that, those meter reads 
um, uh, at the end of the month for the water and wastewater billing because it really helped at least us generate to see where we're at at the end of April with those with that cost center. Um, and then the second part of the analysis is really that projected impact for 2020. So from now to the end of the year, what is this really going to be uh, looking like for uh, the town of Rampart and for the budget? Um, and then you'll see I've broken it out once again, similar to the biannual. We're looking at those cost centers uh, individually. Uh, we're looking at levy based. We're looking at the water wastewater. Uh, and then uh, uh, for this case for impacts, then we're also looking at waste management due to the impact on the landfill. Um, and that's really because those uh, centers are really funded um, uh, funded differently. So we do need to kind of look at them uh, individually when we look at impacts. So, oh, one sec. Sorry, I lost my slide here. Okay, uh, so this is the snapshot of those actuals um, that are going all the way till April 30th. And you'll see that I've broken it out uh, in the levy, the water versus wastewater uh, and the waste management. Um, and then hopefully not too confusing, but I've also tried to break it down into the impacts on revenue, cost containment measures. So how we're cutting expenses um, in order to offset some of those things, showing that net operating impact, um, then any capital budget offsets, and then we're getting that total surplus deficit of what the impacts are for the various cost centers. Um, for both for levy, water, wastewater, and waste management. So that's a, a snapshot of, of kind of uh, at end of April 30th of what those things look like. Um, and I wanted to just touch base a little bit on um, the mitigation measures that have been put in place. Um, understandably, there is a little bit of a time lag for some of those things uh, once we put them in place. So for example, you know, on March 13th, when we had to close our facilities, we obviously all the cost mitigation measures, you know, whether that was, you know, um, you know, uh, staff reductions versus uh, cost implication measures that we could cut back at facilities, they didn't happen immediately day one, those things take a little bit of time to put in place. So uh, we're seeing a little bit of that time lag uh, come in here. Uh, but it's interesting, you can see already that by the end of the end of May, 99% uh, of those impacts are now being covered by the cost containment measures. Um, and the thing that I'll discuss a little bit more as we go on in the projections is really um, the uncertainty that surrounds the September to December timeframe um, and how we can build a contingency and a buffer uh, in order to get a comfort zone so that we can feel comfortable moving into that fourth quarter of the year. So when we look at the impact projections um, uh, for COVID-19, um, I did want to clarify one point here. Um, I know there was a little bit of uh, questionings on um, what assumptions are included into these projections. So the assumptions that I've included in these projections, really the projections go to the end of the year. Uh, what the tables and charts are depicting is that the pro projection assumes that the facilities remain closed until August 30th, 2020, and then they reopen on September 1st, 20, on, on September 1st. So while we all know that these facilities could open at an earlier or later date, um, you really have to do, we did really have to pick a date uh, in order to calculate the projections out. Um, and, you know, given the reopening plan that's been put in place uh, in front of us right now by the province with their step one stage, uh, sorry, stage one, stage two, and stage three, uh, we think these dates are really a conservative target at this time. Um, and so you can see on the charts that um, we don't really show any impacts beyond that August 30 because it assumes that the field facilities will be open, that revenues will be returning, um, and that the mitigation measures uh, in place have halted. However, uh, obviously assuming that the September to December timeframe will be normal and will generate normal revenues is not really realistic. Um, so that's why we're really recommending that that contingency or, or buffer zone uh, be put in place and that's what will help address any of those shortfalls that will occur during that time period. Um, so you can see here on the chart that we are predicting, um, let's take for the levy-based cost centers, that uh, by the end of August, we'll have a surplus built up of over $639,000. Um, and that will help us going into the fall that should revenues uh, not be meeting the targets of what they would normally be in the year, you have that as a buffer zone to help offset that. Um, we all are also recommending, and I'll touch base on a further slide, some further contingency, members, uh, contingency measures be put in place, which would be an additional 109,000 added on to this. So really um, at the end of the, this um, report, should council accept the recommendations, 
that contingency would increase to $748,000 um, as basically a contingency or a buffer zone um, to give you that comfort level going into quarter four in order to offset any sort of other further impacts that could um, arise during that time. Um, when we look at uh, specifically uh, the levy funded cost centers, uh, if you look at, uh, I know I provided a lot of detailed charts that are at the back of um, the tables, but really those co cost containment measures uh, do begin to fully offset the revenue impacts. Um, and, you know, you don't want to just um, offset them at uh, 100%. You want to be offsetting them um, over that, right, just due to the uncertainty and everything that's involved. So right now they're, they're fully offsetting the revenue impacts by over 156%, uh, even before those capital budget offsets are applied. Um, so as I kind of indicated before, generally, something like that would be more than sufficient buffer for our financial planning purpose. However, given that level of uncertainty and, and the likelihood of further or rapid changes, uh, we do recommend these further contingency measures that were included in the report to help build that buffer a little bit more. Um, flipping over to water wastewater. Um, as I touched on a little bit earlier, uh, we do include the assumptions um, that April consumption continues along until August 30th, um, uh, which I really do feel is probably most likely an overestimate, um, like a worst case scenario. Um, as more businesses open, and we can already see them opening, we know the hardware stores are open now, garden centers, um, plus as, as uh, Councillor Lynch, uh, County Councillor Lynch suggested some seasonal um, increases through the summer period, uh, we do think there will be additional consumption that will come down. So I think um, using those April consumption numbers and projecting them out, um, probably, um, I, I do think the, the real scenario is probably going to be a little bit more better than that. Uh, when we look at how to offset uh, lost revenues for water wastewater, you really have a lot more limited mitigation measures that are available um, due to really the base cost that it costs to run water and wastewater facilities. Um, you have to maintain that base to run it no matter uh, what some of your consumptions are. Uh, so you have less wiggle room there in order to just cut back on some expenses in your operating budget to, um, to mitigate some of those items. Um, however, we do know that the current capital offsets uh, are sufficient to cover the projected revenue losses to the end of June. Um, um, and we do, I, I do recommend that we do wait for a few more um, months of additional billing cycles and get that further consumption, consumption data and see where um, the water wastewater center um, is going to go before we made any more, um, um, basically, before we did anything else on this cost center. Um, I definitely wouldn't be recommending any further water or wastewater rate increases or anything like that to address this at this point until we saw more data um, going forward to see really where um, the full trend was going out to. Flipping over to the other cost center, um, cost center which would be waste management. Um, the scenarios that I've included in the report project that the landfill would remain closed to August 30th, 2020. Um, even based on our discussions tonight uh, in um, the CEO's report, uh, we know that's likely a, a much overstated timeline um, given the steps that were, are already in progress uh, to reopen the landfill. Um, we do know that um, uh, if we open up by end of May on a financial uh, revenue uh, perspective, um, the losses there will be more on the 35k as opposed to the 85k so a 50k difference uh, which would be good so it's, it's important that we get that um, those revenues flowing. Uh, we also project that perhaps there may be some increased tipping fees uh, revenues for the first few weeks which will help potentially offset some of those decreased revenues that we've already heard. If people have been um, keeping some of their um, whether they're cleaning up their basements or doing some um, uh, or the garages and things like that, uh, you know, and holding on to those things, we may have um, some increased tipping fees that will help, um, you know, generate a bit more revenues after they open. So we'll, we'll see what those fall out as. So going back to the additional contingency uh, measures, um, as I already um, touched on, um, this is really to address that uncertainty and unpredictability for the September to December timeframe. Um, in order to address any of the unanticipated uh, revenue losses in that time period. Um, because really, if you think at it, it um, if you assumed that the facility were to remain closed all the way to December, you can already see that the mitigating measures uh, for cost containment are already covering the revenue losses as we project out month by month. That would just continue for the year uh, and uh, 
that is really what I'm going to say would be the, the um, uh, is easier to cost out. What's harder is where we feel the more realistic scenario is, is where you're actually going to be probably opening your facility partway through this year without knowing what are your revenues going to be really being. You're going to have all the basic costs of opening your facility. Are you going to have enough revenues in order to support that? Uh, and that's really where that uncertainty comes in place. And that's really why we are um, recommending some additional uh, measures here in order to build that buffer zone because we don't want to end up at the end of the year uh, and be short. Um, so as part of this exercise, um, uh, we did do a full operating capital review completed to see what else we could be adding into these contingency measures. Um, they include uh, looking at the CIP program and putting that on hold for 2020. Um, that would be for about 15, uh, 15,000. Um, I think it would be fair to say that I'm not quite sure in the current climate whether businesses would be looking to be doing items like facade improvements um, and items like that at this time. Uh, we're also looking to potentially reduce the scope of the eco-friendly uh, weeds pay program that could save up to 26,500. Uh, we could reduce the scope of the spring and the summer plantings uh, for an additional 30. Uh, we could look to put the beach sand replenishment on hold uh, until the province allows beach openings. That would be for about 7,500. Uh, we can put minor capital projects on hold at a 50% level, which would save another 15. Uh, and the community hall divider project on hold uh, for um, another 15. So overall, if you looked at uh, those contingency measures added on to the savings that are already in place, um, you can see that overall that builds for about that $748,000 buffer for council heading into that quarter four. Um, I also wanted to just touch base on that. I, um, uh, some council members had some great questions for me uh, uh, based on this report. Um, and I did send out um, a memo that highlighted a few additional pieces of information, which I wanted to touch on. Uh, so one of those questions was, do these projections go to year end? Um, so hopefully I've been able to answer that uh, in the memo and in the, my presentation to say that yes, these projections um, do go out to the year end. Um, and also um, one of the questions that came through was, should we be looking at operating and uh, capital separately? Um, to touch on that a little bit more is, is really you need to be looking at operating capital together. Um, the operating budget really generates that transfer to reserves, which then funds capital. Um, and your annual tax rate that, that you set um, is determined by that level of funding required. Uh, and this is similar if you look at, for example, the financial uh, studies that are done for water and wastewater, uh, determining the rates for water and wastewater. You include your operating and your capital projections in that as well to determine what, you, what your rates would be. Um, so really, uh, in this sense of looking at it for your whole year and the impact on um, the town budgets, you really do want to be looking at that operating and capital together. Um, uh, I think I touched base on this one too already. Should further actions be taken, such as raising water and wastewater rates to address uh, small, uh, the small deficit position that's projected? Uh, once again, I feel that another month or two to see where those water wastewater um, consumptions are going to trend to will be important. Uh, to be considering before um, any sort of large adjustment will be made to any rates. Um, also, another question that was asked was, should additional capital projects uh, be placed on hold um, and added to the contingency? So, um, great question. Um, based on our current projections and the recommendations, the, the contingency fund is, is, is fairly robust and is built up to that 750k. Uh, we do feel that that's a good level uh, going into that September, December uh, uh, time period uh, without having to put any further capital projects on hold. Um, you do want to make sure that uh, we're not going to be putting our AMP and our asset management replacement and things like that. Um, uh, we don't want to put us behind and we also then don't want to be able to, um, you know, having to be doubling, doubling up in 2021 as well um, and can kind of get behind. Uh, another important project uh, or another point is that we are want to be make sure that we do have some projects uh, shovel ready. Uh, and this is if some government grants do come down um, the pipe or we, we've been seeing some things come down um, that suggest that there might be some sort of um, maybe an economic uh, stimulus uh, kind of thing to get the economy going. Sometimes that results in some infrastructure grants. We want to make sure we have those shovel project uh, readies in order to, um, uh, to jump on them. Um, and then just a third point on that one was we want to make sure that we have enough lead time. Some of the ordering on some of our equipment takes, you know, 12 to 18 months and we definitely don't want to get behind on that. 
Um, and another question that came about was how will the deferred capital projects such as Alicia Street be dealt with next year in 2021 without significantly impacting the tax rate? Um, so I just wanted to touch base on that. So um, really every year as part of our comprehensive budgeting exercise, uh, we do prioritize capital projects that is looked at, we do review it. Um, and working unplanned projects into the long range capital forecast is, is really not unheard of. In past years, we have worked significant projects uh, into the long range. Um, an example of that would include the Nick Smith Center mold uh, abatement. That project came up completely unplanned and we had to find those dollars uh, and shift things around in the long range to fit that in. Um, additionally, uh, items like advancing the 16 inch river crossing, we had to rejig our uh, priorities to get those in as well. So this fall, that annual exercise will be conducted. It will continue to look at Alicia Street um, and we will be presenting that capital and long range capital forecast to, to council at budget time for consideration. Um, Fortunately, uh, the five-year capital financing plan for the downtown revitalization project does end in 2021, uh, which actually does free up about $400,000 um, of funding um, that could be utilized uh, to help fund uh, 2021 capital projects, uh, which I think timing-wise right now is, uh, is, a, is a great thing. Um, and of course, uh, we always do recommend that we are taking those debt payments and as the debt um, does expire that we are Putting that back into capital investment. So those are some potential ways that we can look at uh, Alicia Street for next year. Um, future financial reports. Um, looking forward, um, part of the, uh, the recommendations was also to request organizations receiving a 2020 municipal grant to provide an update to their budgets um, by September 1st, 2020. Um, not knowing really where um, um, groups like the library, the airport, the archives are sitting financially. Uh, I think it's important um, that we try and reach out to them and find out um, what their financial situation is just to make sure to see will there be any sort of impacts in 2020. Um, also, um, um, there was the recommendation that included that um, since this is such a constantly changing and rapidly moving um, uh, situation, uh, really monthly financial updates I think are a must um, during the state of declared provincial emergency uh, to be brought forward to be able to provide council with the information that you need for decision making. So that was a long winded <laughs> presentation, but uh, I'll open it up for any sort of questions. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Excuse me, sorry. Um, questions, comments? Yeah, just before we start, uh, I wanted to also just inject something here. I've been through this and appreciate that this a lot of valuable information here, but I do have a motion on the COVID-19 part of it that I wanna propose at the end of this, but I'd like us to go through Jennifer's report. I'm running out of power here, sorry. Jennifer's report and have a vote on that and then discuss the other lately. I just said that I need to plug into another power uh, source. So I don't know if I'll lose anybody or not. But, uh, so any comments or questions? Uh, Who's, who's below Ted? Uh, Dan, sorry. There's a screen block here that's... Uh, Dan? Can't hear him. Can you hear me? No? Dan, you're not unmuted. There. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, was for on page 21, uh, for on the reductions of the spring and the planting for the 30,000, if these uh, businesses are going to be open for curbside and whatnot in the downtown area, I'm wondering if we can do some sort of flowering. I mean, when you go downtown now, it looks like a dead zone. There's no parking, there's nobody, well, there's people walking, but that's about it. If, if the business opened, then I think possibly we should have some flowers out there just to, I won't say spruce it up, but certainly to get a better atmosphere. Thank you. Do you want to I have a comment to that? But Jennifer, do you want to respond first? Um, absolutely. So, um, County Councilor Lynch, really, what's proposed there, um, um, and and John can speak to it more uh, if if you would like to jump in onto that. But by all means, if Council would like to see some additional flowers onto that, yeah. we could go somewhere in a happy medium um, in those reductions in order to provide a little bit more and yet still have some cost savings. Um, I know right now all those contingency yeah. measures combined uh, equate to about 109,000. Um, if council wanted to reduce that a little bit to, you know, an even 100,000 or something like that, we could provide those additional funds back to John in order to be able to provide 
um, at least some baskets and things like that into the downtown. We lost, we lost the mayor. mayor, so maybe we better hold off for just a moment, get him back up online if anybody, nobody has an objection. The chair is important to our discussion. Is Oliver helping him out, Maureen? Just give him a moment. Did he bring the power code from his office? Technology, a wonderful thing when it works, a nightmare when it doesn't. While we're waiting, am I allowed to talk? Yes. <laughs> Just an opening comment. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for well appreciated for the very detail. I, I'm very comfortable with your report. Thanks. Thank you. We may have to change um, a electronic device <laughs> for the mayor, uh, which is a technical difficulty, but Lynn is actually the deputy <laughs> mayor at this point. Um, maybe Lynn, if you just want to say we can continue with this discussion on the flowers. You can definitely continue with the discussion on the flowers, but seeing as I know the mayor has a motion that he wants to put forth and whatnot, we can't go beyond that. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, okay. definitely. I, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I think uh, the mayor wanted to make a comment on the flowers as well, because okay. I think he said that at the end, I got a comment on the flowers. Yeah, but if there's anything more that council wants to discuss okay. beforehand, but I don't, I'm not sure that there's anything more to say. So we want to make sure that we don't go any further. Chris? Well, yeah, just uh, just one thing. Um, when I read page 21 and you were going to uh, reduce the scope of the flowers and uh, like in the downtown core, there's the flower beds that are at street level. Okay, and then there's also the hanging baskets. Uh, now, are you proposing to like eliminate all of that? I can jump in here. Can everybody oh. hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so basically what we've proposed in the report uh, to clarify on Chris's question, uh, or Councillor Toner's question, um, we kept in the curbside planters. So the new planters that are in the sidewalk that have the irrigation system built in, we had intended to still fill those with flowers for a couple of reasons. One, because if you don't plant them, they're going to look a little rough all winter or all summer long. But secondly, they have that built-in irrigation system. So there's a lot less um, maintenance involved uh, when it comes to our watering crews. Um, obviously, we made the decision to not proceed with the hiring of, of summer students. And that was, that was a fairly significant job uh, that does get completed every year, watering the hanging baskets on the light poles, as well as all the planters and planter boxes around the waterfront and Robertson Park and some of the other parks. So, um, so again, we've proposed to keep the planter, the curbside planter beds in the downtown in and, and fill them up. Uh, but everything else essentially is out. Thank you, John. So John? John, we're still going to have planters hanging. As it stands, as we recommended in the report, no, we don't, we don't have the hanging baskets in. That being said, we can certainly, like it's, it's in council's hands right now as to whether or not we want to uh, revise what we're doing a little bit here. There, there's, no, there's no exact science to it. It was really just trying to f find some cost saving measures without sacrificing all of the plantings in the downtown. Uh, but certainly there's, there's room for negotiation and discussion as to what we add in here. Tom, was your comment about this as well? Yes, it was, Lynn. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, I just, uh, it's going to be hard 
to accomplish what was accomplished last year for sure. And there were so many positive comments regarding the flowers and that along with the library in the downtown area. It would be wonderful if we can do it, but I think if we can't do it, then I think the residents of the town of Iron Prior would realize that we're doing the best job we can. You know, further to that, what I was just gonna say too was, um, John, uh, I agree that we should forego the hanging baskets as much as I love to see how beautiful, but we do have to cut our costs to help mitigate our bottom line. Um, if that is what in fact we uh, all collectively decide to do by the end of this conversation, I would really like to see that that um, be very well communicated with the residents so that they realize that we aren't taking a step back that it's just uh, a precaution for the bottom line for this year alone. Ted, you had a qu comment? Yes, uh, the hanging baskets are high cost maintenance because it takes staff, it takes vehicles uh, and time to water the baskets more so than the, as John has suggested, the, one, the, the areas with automatic waters, uh, watering systems we could do a fairly good job and, and take away from the barrenness downtown, but the overhead stuff is very costly. Yeah, agreed. Any other comment on this? So I think unfortunately we are at a stalemate to wait for the mayor to hook back in here. We, we could actually take a short recess if you would like. I think, I think we should do that, Maureen, just because the content of what is moving forward really does, uh, the mayor does have, again, a motion that he wants to put about. So it's not like we can just continue on with this meeting. Um, you know, if it wasn't, oh, here he's coming. There we go. Sorry about that. I swear I didn't do it on purpose. I also say I don't even know what happened. Okay, so in your absence, because yeah, I, I didn't ask if the meeting was over, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> just be doing that, we were discuss. We just continued to further discuss about the f flowers, um, yeah. and John had, had explained that the planters in the ground downtown would still be would still be planted because they have their own irrigation system. Uh, and watering system is the hanging baskets and whatnot that cost so much to maintain would be the ones that they are proposing that we forego this year. Okay, uh, because my comment wasn't, and that kind of helps with it. I've had a fair, maybe even more than fair feedback from downtown merchants about that issue. And all of them are consistently saying, I hope you know enough not to be spending money on flowers in a year like this. You know, they're all hurting and they're all, uh, so I think we need to really consider that in terms of uh, whether that makes sense and, and is practical to, to do that expenditure this year. I mean, I get uh, Councillor Lynch's point that it may not look as good as it did last year, but you know, when you're one of those small retail businesses that is really, really suffering and you look out and see that money being spent there, I think that's a real concern, a real legitimate concerns so Dan and then thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor uh, my concern was that there'd be nothing um, there and now with uh, John's report saying that we've got the ones with the water going on it then you know we've got life where it was just a dead zone now because of winter yeah. thank you yeah no I understood what what Lynn said I just wanted to feedback that information because I thought it was important for the staff to get it Lynn yeah so what I did say also too was, um, I totally agree that we should forgo the hanging baskets as much as we like to see how beautiful and we got so many comments last year. Um, but I had also asked if that is what the, the council does collectively agree upon is that uh, it be very well communicated to the residents that we're foregoing X to help save money and then next year, hopefully, we will be able to reimburse the town with its uh, with its beautification. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point, Ted. Yes, just for clarification, uh, Jennifer, the cutback in the flowers. Um, if in fact we pro we proceed with planting some flowers, was there money left for that, or was all the money removed? So the, the, the money that is recommended um, as part of that contingency matter 
that was just the um, um, John has already kept enough money for his downtown plantings. Okay. So they haven't been included in that. If then. Thank you. So I think the number was thirty thousand. I saw or something, wasn't it? Yes. So what was the total? What amount is going to be spent? I guess is what we need to be making people aware of. You have an idea, John, of what that sounds? Yeah, I, I just don't have the numbers in front of me, but if I recall, for the for the new curbed planting beds in the downtown that we did as part of the streetscape, I think we were roughly seven seven grand seventy five hundred dollars to plant all those. Which mm -hmm. you know, after the success last year, I think that was money well spent. But um, so I just want to clarify again. Um, we, what we don't actually have in here is um, some of the plantings at the library and museum. They were kind of captured in, uh, in the 30,000 as well. So they're kind of a gray area. They're sort of a curbside planter bed along the mm -hmm. buildings there and those planter boxes that the men's shed built. Um, we might be able to uh, include those as well because they do have automatic watering ability and uh, the staff at the museum often assist with watering some of those flowers at the front entrance and whatnot. So we, we could keep some of that into a couple hanging baskets on the building itself. Um, but yeah, you're, you're roughly $7,500 for those downtown curbed planting beds is what we spent last year. So are we saying there won't be hanging baskets or there'll be some hanging baskets? I guess I'm just throwing it out there. At this point, we have, we have no hanging baskets proposed. Um, but if there was a, if there was an interest for just some of the facilities as opposed to the downtown uh, streetlights, that's something we could, we could also look at. My feeling and recommendation would be is none. I think in the downtown area, there'd be, you know, if first financially, you know, I think we need to hang on to that 30 grand. And if we're not going to do them anywhere in town, I think it's better that way than start to pick certain spots. Comments from council, Lisa? Mine doesn't relate actually. Did you did you want to finish up on flower beds? Mine was um, more a question for Jennifer just regarding the, the her, her okay, I saw I saw Tom's hand, so if that's what it is, Tom. Well, I was just uh, going to agree with you, Your Worship. I don't think we should be putting them on the museum or otherwise, if we're not going to put them on other areas downtown as well. I think we should eliminate it altogether, yeah. the hanging baskets. Okay, thanks. Anything else on the flowers then, Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Not to beat this up, at the museum, John, we have water-fed uh, men's shed things. Those will have flowers, correct? Uh, the $7,500 that I just quoted was just the downtown curb. So the new curb um, planters in the in the streetscape, but it does not include the men's shed planter boxes at the museum uh, or the main garden along the library. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so nothing else on that. I'll go to Lisa. She has another question. Uh, Jennifer, first of all, my, my apologies that I didn't send this to you as a written question ahead of today. Um, with regards to your presentation um, and where we're at, has there been any analysis done or, or the best estimates on what our additional curbside waste collection is going to cost us? Um, I'm, because I'm assuming as part of our contract with the extra two bags, basically doubling up on our collection rates. And I know oh, at least a lot of my neighbors have been taking advantage of it. Um, is there an expectation that that's going to cost us more in the long run? And do we know when we might see those numbers? Um, I'm going to let John, can you mm -hmm. respond to that one, John? I know you've been more in contact with the contractors. I'm sorry, I only caught a couple pieces of that. Could I, could I trouble you to just ask that one more time? Yeah, uh, no worries. And again, I'm sorry I didn't send it to you sooner, John. Uh, with the doubling up of curbside um, collection, I'm. Right. I'm guessing that our contract has, you know, a, a, a limit, right, a, a range, and I'm just wondering whether we have any idea on where we're sitting in that range, what the additional cost would be, should we exceed that range, which I'm expecting we might, um, because that will need to be built into some of our budgeting discussions too. As far as the range of what it costs us to collect that additional garbage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, our contractor has, has graciously agreed to to collect that additional those additional bags from the curbside at no additional fee to the town so 
Um, that's certainly um, highly appreciated by the town uh, of our contractor. So really the, the only additional cost involved at this point um, is really just the additional um, use of space in our landfill, which is pretty minimal really in the grand scheme of things as far as the life of the landfill goes. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good news. That was very generous of them and supportive of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Mr. Mayor, you had a motion? Yeah, no, Mr. I think he's uh, frozen. I think we should all almost go to uh, have this back at the Civic Center and space our tables and social distancing so that uh, we don't run into these technical problems. Yeah, maybe. So we'll just, we'll just, uh... I see if Marine has gone to see if somebody can go and check on him. Oh, he's yeah, gone. The is there. Yeah. yeah. Give him another minute to uh, to hook back up. I have to admit, in all these Zoom calls, this is our first real big technical difficulty. So, <laughs> managed to make it through the first few without it. So, I guess we were due. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. I thought for a moment that uh, the mayor was auditioning to be an act for the prior Palooza as a, as a statue. <laughs> Just give him a minute. Yeah, this is unfortunate. We were doing so well, Jennifer, you're right. Well. Jennifer, is he, like you have control over all of who's in and who's out. Has he totally disappeared from your monitor too? He dropped off. I'm just, if he's trying to reboot, sometimes it'll take a minute for him to spin back in. So if they're just gonna refresh his system, um, then. Oh. I know doing these, uh, doing these online meetings really eats your battery. So this is something that I know the very first one we did, I ran out of battery and I didn't have a charge cord here because normally you have I have four hours on it so I thought I don't need my charge cord but I think it drains the battery faster, faster. so it's just I uh, see Oliver's asking to be let in perhaps that's the mayor on his computer okay let me try that one Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> You'd look better on this one, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> We're uh, switching to the tablet here. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Much better. Just give me a second here, okay? Mm -hmm. So I guess there is no torch up there. So how is the power on it? So it'll be fine. It's almost at 100% of control. Okay. Still up, Ken. Still working around here. Okay, I guess we're ready. No, that's fine. We're ready to, to go ahead wherever we. So, Mr. Mayor, what happened was you froze up just at the end of uh, the conversation of the. Um, the waste management doing the, uh, the free extra pickup for us. You said how great that was and then you froze up. So whatever you said after that was gone. I just said it was much, much appreciated and generous of them. Has John left the meeting now? No, oh, he's with us. Oh, I'm he's still not here. with me. Can you, can you see me now? No. Mm. No. So on your screen, do you see all the panels 
in a row or are you? I do, yes. <laughs> the nine panels fit nicely here, but I'm missing one. Well, if you're only seeing nine, then you're missing quite a few. I only got six. I have to use a little button to scroll over. Really? Yep. Wow, I have 14 panels. I have everybody. So there would be an arrow, uh, Walter, to scroll to see the others that you're not seeing. Just like when the presentation is up, there should be an arrow on either side so you can scroll. No, there's no arrow on either side. If you see in the top right corner, you could try hitting enter full screen in the very top right corner. Uh -huh. And then that should open it up for everybody. I got everybody. There you go. Sort of. Maybe uh, Maureen, we can send somebody in to see Walter to enter the, to open that up for him. Walter, you must have muted yourself too, because we can't hear you. Because uh, Mike is gone. Yeah. Oh. He's Mike is gone. I told him. gone. Yeah, I already told him. So I don't know if he can hear us though. Oh, he's connecting audio. I don't want to connect. So, Maureen, I'm wondering what Maybe we you can come sit at my computer. Possibly just take a five minute recess, Lynn. Okay, so let's motion. Can I have a motion to take a five minute recess? Lisa, Ted, all in favor? Thank you. Maybe everyone turn off, uh, mute their mute our mics and just leave the video. So we have to please uh, watch your time and come back in five minutes though, everyone, because there's no way of coming to get you. <laughs> Thank you. So can people hear us now? I can Hello? hear you, yes. Yeah. Uh, on Walter's system, yes, we can hear you. Great, great. Okay, but, but where is everybody though? So well, we, we had to enforce a five minute recess till we get you up and running. Good. Okay, everybody so they probably shut off for that five minute recess. Maybe, yeah, maybe just turn up the video. Okay. Okay, so they may have shut off for the five minute recess, and that's why they're not visible. Right. There's no Tom, there's yeah. no John, Jennifer's right. not even there. They'll, so. they'll come, when they come back, you'll see them. Ready? Fix this. Up. <laughs> <laughs> we were just saying how well it's been going. Yeah. Who did this, Emily? Yeah, it's all Emily's fault. <laughs> Walter, you got to stop kicking the computer. 
Yeah. 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 There we go. Yes, I know. It, I'm, I'm not surprised it's me when it comes to the technology. I'm not as good as Dan is at it. Mm -hmm. So you, you can almost say Councillor Toner and Councillor Lynch, if they can still hear us, you should come back and McGee, they can come back. Just give them a minute. Yeah, Oliver thought they turned off their video, maybe. They turned the video off when they left their desk, yeah. I guess. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lynch, for stepping in like that. That was great. <laughs> Unintended, but thank you very much. Lynch or Grinstead? <laughs> You're muted, Marie. I, I did mean Grinstead. <laughs> Grinstead. I've been called a whole lot of things, but not a Lynch. <laughs> Well, there's Dan coming back, or he walked through the room anyways. I guess they all got different clocks for the five minutes. It's probably the problem. Uh, and I even said, please be very careful with your time because I, we have no way of going and collecting you. There we are. There's Dan. So we're looking for Chris and Lisa now. No, they're there, Walter. Not on my screen yet. I'm here. I'm, I'm here. here. Well, one of the faster five minutes. I'll see if I do. The mayor. It is, they are ours, so why are you seeing them? Can't see everyone. Give me one second. Okay, so there's a lot of this. just bring it in. Maureen, it's time to give up your computer. <laughs> um, and uh, if we had to have a vote, we could also do a recorded vote. So we could just ask audio instead of uh, a ra raising your hands so that uh, if the mayor cannot see who's raising their hands, we can do a recorded vote. But if That's there's fine. discussion, how do I know who wants to speak? Yeah. Um, we we can let you know. Yes, because we can see everybody. Oh, great. Yeah. In the interest of time, Walter, maybe that's what we should do. Or go to the CEO's yeah. office and use hers. What if I turn off my video? I'm going to have to see you. I wonder if staff drop off the video and we'll raise the council members. They're going to try shutting down some staff videos and see if the counselors come in. There's Chris for Robin. Jennifer's going to uh, shut hers off and maybe Lisa will come in there. Jenna, if you shut down your video, they might be able to see the mayor may be able to see Lisa. Robin shut down and Chris came in. Yeah, there's Lisa now. Okay. Nope. Yeah, all the councils there for you? Yeah, seven of us are in and I got Maureen and Emily 
uh, aside from that, so we should be okay. Uh, so now somebody has to tell me where we left off. <laughs> Who was? Uh, I think you were just uh, at the end of the discussion and ready on, to move on. From the flowers? Yeah. And the contract, garbage contract, yes. And the garbage contract, yeah. Right. Yes, yes. I mean, that was Lisa's question, right? Yes. Okay, so are we, any other questions or comments on it? No, everybody's good with it? Okay, so then, and I uh, wanna make a couple comments and then talk to this motion I have. And, you know, I've been, this COVID-19 thing, I know it's wore everybody out and uh, the effort being put in to manage it is tremendous and it's much appreciated. Uh, and I don't want to be the pessimist or the negative one, but I really, you know, I, I follow every bit of news I can every day. And if you listen to any CBC today, you would have heard that in the month of March, 1 million Canadians lost their jobs. And in April, 2 million Canadians lost their jobs. So my concern is that we not only don't get ahead of ourselves in terms of what the reopening will do, and how quick it'll come. And I don't mean just us as a, as the town of Empire, but you know, the whole thing. And when it does reopen and come back, we know it's gonna be a gradual sort of process. And I don't know what that's gonna mean in terms of revenues and Jennifer made that point earlier and what it's gonna be. So I'm really, uh, and I meant it to being hung up in this, but I'm really hung up on to specifics for the corporation by department and absolutely through to the end of the year to understanding our financial position. And I know that includes even more assumptions and, and projections to do it, but we need to have a plan. And I keep using the word plan because with God's help, we'll never have to implement any part of it or any of it, but there needs to be a plan to use the, uh, the capital uh, term shelf ready to go because then some of the movements that we make or decisions we have to make to implement them will require timelines. So I'm concerned that that plan isn't finally formalized in detail, ready sitting on the shelf. So then it goes and we can deal with that through the timelines required on, on different sections of it. I, I am encouraged by Jennifer's report and it, and it covers a lot of things. I just wanna get down to more specific, I guess, by department sort of understanding where we are. And my concern is that it's going to be, you know, it's for the rate payers in Empire because talking to a person this past week or so, uh, we made reference or he made reference to the, uh, to the term that we're all in this together. And we are, but his comment was we're in this together, but not equally. And that really struck home with me. There's a large percentage of our population that is not in this on an equal basis, that is suffering tremendously from an economic point of view, and Empire has their, their share of that population. So their ability to manage and their own lives, let alone pay bills and pay the bills that this town needs, not only in the next three or four months or the end of 2020, but over the next two or three years is gonna be critical. So that's, I'm just saying all of this so you understand where my head's at and uh, what I'm lying awake at night thinking about and why I want to get down into so much detail about what's our worst case scenario for December 31st, 2020. And I think we need to do that, package it, be prepared to deal with it. And then, like I said, put it on the shelf and maybe by some good luck and others, we won't have to, won't have to do it. So I'm giving you that bit of preamble to this motion that I am uh, going to move now. Walter, Marie yeah. has her hand up. I think that- Audience. I think procedurally you have to change what you're That's doing. That's right. I think I think we haven't dispensed with with the report from the uh, with the treasurer yet. Oh, I didn't call for the That's for the right. vote on it. That's right. I apologize for that. Sorry, with the interruption, I kind of lost track of where we are. So I do need a, a an all in favor vote on the on yes. the COVID nineteen report. Okay, and it's carried unanimously. Good. Thank you. Sorry about that. So if you can now uh, remember my preamble, I'll go into my, my motion. <laughs> thanks and uh, thanks for the patience. So what I've done is I'm saying, whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous disruption to the 
operation of the municipality and has resulted in serious impacts on the financial status of the operating year 2020. Whereas we, the council, the town of Ampera have a real responsibility to answer to our ratepayers and a twofold perspective during such trying times. The first one on my mind is that being to, be, being to, uh, being regularly communicating accurately, regular and accurately with, uh, with the best information in the most timely manner to keep them informed. And then the second one is that being, that being to protect them from any avoidable harm or negative impact, both from a health and safety perspective, as well as a financial risk. So in my view, we are the board of directors of the corporation. There are shareholders of the residents of Iron Prayer, and they must be given all the information available as accurately as we can and as quickly as we can. We are responsible as a council to minimize any negative impacts and consider their ability to manage the outcomes, particularly their ability to pay when it's a financial concern. Therefore, uh, by this motion, we would direct the CAO to provide for council a follow-up report to the May 11th, 20 report, and that would be structured in a two-part form. A summary of the capital projects for 2020 to include the known financial impacts as well as the delays or reschedules. That any funds not expended in 2020 due to deferred projects should be considered held in reserve for those projects that will go ahead in the next year or two. Also that during 2021, budget preparation, the process of review and update of the 20 year capital plan will be completed, completed considering the COVAC-19 impacts. And in fairness to Jennifer, she spoke to that in her presentation, you will remember. <clears throat> to a further review of the 2020 operating budget be continued and summarized in the second report that clearly outlines for council and the rate, rate paying public the following. First, a worst case scenario for the, for the year end of 2020 due to the facts of COVID-19 on the operating budget. That it is understood by using the information available and building on financial assumptions that we will formulate financial projections for the year end. Then there needs to be a department by department summary of all measures that have been taken and will be taken to minimize any potential negative effect on the budget. These measures should include, but not be limited to review all grants issued by the town, the level of services that may have to be adjusted, which could include hours of operation, the review of all line items in the budget for future cost reductions to be used as an offset of any projected deficit. Also the impacts of the deferred impact assessment. Further that the CEO will be authorized to use all the corporation's resources to perform the work necessary to complete this, this task. That will include all the in-house resources required as well as the support of the corporation's accounting firm that is currently uh, in the process of completing our audit may be helpful in, in the areas of developing assumptions and doing projections. One of these, which is the reality of, of a potential 0% tax increase in 2021 budget. This report will be done for this, from the starting point of the mid-year June 30th, 20, and by by each quarter of the last half of 2020 and summarized as year end result. This follow-up report could be for, uh, to the May 20 submission presented to council for a review consideration by June 1st, 20th. So that's where my head's at and I'm moving that, but it goes nowhere until it's seconded. So, uh, okay, Lynn's seconded. So I open it up for discussion and I hope I've kind of explained uh, where I'm going with it. Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I listened to your uh, your motion. I would like to see it in the handwritten or typed so I can digest it even more because some of the parts I agreed with, some of them I didn't agree with. But to tell you what line you were on, I, I can't. Thanks. Okay, I appreciate that. But as you know, and I had I had a discussion with the clerk to make sure I was doing this procedurally correct today, and I couldn't do that in in advance without advancing the business of council. And I did look at trying to uh, send that to you in advance. So- Can we then so, make the motion to uh, defer it for uh, three days? I'm more than, I, I would like to get it in your hands so you could read it and you know, so that's, if that's the motion by you, Dan, then, and I see Lisa's hand and head nodding there. 
Yeah. Do you want to second that, Lisa? I would, yes, please. Okay, so all in favor of that? Good, that's fine. I appreciate that. And we'll get it to you so you can have time to, to read it. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Okay. So the next uh, thing is the correspondence package. Then. But the correspondence package number I-20 May 07 be received as information and filed accordingly. Mover in a seconder, please. Lisa, Ted, all in favor? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, okay, Dan, comment Dan. Could we make a, a comment to say that uh, under correspondence, an electronic message board dealing with COVID-19 reporting will be on the south side of Daniel Street at Madawaska Boulevard? And on, on the 17th of May, there's a new four-way stop in place at White Lake Road in Vanjimar Bev Shaw. And the mobile- okay, this, Just a sec, Dan, again, because I'm looking, because those would be, uh, and Marina and I talked about this today, would be announcement type things, Marina. Is this okay from a- Okay, I can't hear her, but I can see her nodding her head, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan, sorry. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> So the mobile COVID-19 testing units are visiting our prior to test selected residents who have been referred by the Renfrew County Health Unit for testing by family doctors. And lastly, all county notices including reports for the County Health Unit have been forwarded to staff and to counselors. To go on to what you were saying, Mr. Mayor, uh, for all the uh, publications and whatnot available to the residents, they're online at the county. To, to know who's got what or where we're going and, and what the plans are for the county to ensure that everyone's being looked after. As well, 1.4 million came into the county for our less fortunate residents. So if you can't pay the rent, they got the money for you. Thank you. Okay, just a uh, you know, follow up on that. It's, uh, you know, the, I'm watching the Renford County report on testing every day. And it's one of the reasons I'm concerned about the things I am, even to hit 2,200 people tested in Renford County with a population of 102,000 is nothing. It's barely over 2% of the population. And I don't know what the issues are with testing, whether it's labs to be able to process them or what. Uh, but I did, uh, I think I mentioned before, I wrote Gallant, uh, member. Parliament Glant and MPP John Yakabuski saying that before they completely reopen these small communities, I think there's a need for them to come in and do some sample testing against a wide range of age groups, you know, because we know there are four existing cases in Ampro, which probably means there could be 40, you know, and, and uh, I think we're still at high risk. And again, because of our geographic circle of Almont, Carlton Place, Ottawa, that kind of thing. Okay. The, good news, Mr. the good news, Mr. Mayor, is the, the mobile that's been in our empire, the people that have got tested there had got the results back in a day and a half. So it is working, but just not a lot of people. Yeah, no, there needs to be more volume is my point before we really get to. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that relates to the testing thing that we need to be concerned about is every, and again, I'm news addict, but uh, you know, and for the last three or four weeks, but primarily in the U.S., but now across Canada for the last couple of weeks, every news follow-up you watch, and whether it's Premier Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, or Premier Ford, all the top Canadian medical uh, officials are telling us now to be careful. End of October, November into December, they're almost guaranteeing a second wave. So that's part of my concern about things too. Okay, anything else on the correspondence? Pretty heavy list, but it makes a nice one one spot library of all the information. Yeah. Okay. So all in favor then? Good. Carried. Thank you. Got a bylaw. The tax rate. That the following bylaw be and is hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw number seven zero five nine dash twenty adopt the twenty twenty tax rate. Move and seconder. Lynn, Ted. All in favor? Carried, thank you. So now we need a motion to go into closed session. 
that council move into closed session regarding three matters. One matter pursuant to section 239 b of the Municipal Act to discuss a personal matter about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. And one matter pursuant to section 239 b and D of the Municipal Act to discuss a personal matter about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, labor relations or employee negotiations. And one matter pursuant to section 239 2 ENF of the Municipal Act litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Dan and Lisa, all in favor? Carried, we're in close. So. Actually, um, Mr. Mayor, if we could just wait a moment until we stop the line.